My name is Kevin. It's good to be back. I was here last year as well, and uh, thank you for having me back. I like any excuse to come to Paris, so I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm also starting to lose my voice, so I hope my voice uh, makes it through my talk. So, so just a, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm I'm living in Seattle, Washington, um, and uh, I, that's where I I work. And live there. Um, my company, Belibre, is based in Nice, so I'm often in France visiting the office and working a little bit from there as well. Um, I've been at Belibre just since the beginning of this year. Before that, you can see I've worked for a handful of different companies, mostly kind of in the embedded ARM kernel hacking space. Um, and just a little bit about what I do in the kernel. Um, I work on several kind of weird corners of the kernel, not any like major stuff, but lots of little stuff. Um, Although I do, uh, what kind of leads into this talk is the arm sock maintainer. I'm kind of like a, a backup co-maintainer for the arm sock tree, which is where all the, all the arm, various arm kernel, the arm subsystems all kind of meet together. Um, so I help Arndt and Olaf with that, um, as well. And a little bit of stuff about, uh, pandering to the audience about how, how I like to come to this country. And I do speak French as well. So if you, if you have questions later, you want to speak to me in French, that's fine. Um, so we talked about seeing a little bit of the dark side of kernel developers. Uh, this is my uh, this is my backyard office and my collection of uh, hardware, um, which is part of the, the what I'm going to talk about. How I got this the board farm all together. Um, so usually when people come in my office, they don't say anything about the boards. They say, "Why do you collect cables?" And because uh, that's more or less what it looks like. So, and this is actually, this is, uh, this is, um, just a couple of weeks ago, but you also don't see another, there's a whole other set of shelves that I'll show in some other pictures that are growing boards because, uh, I keep getting new hardware. So, and that's my, that's my five year old, uh, lab technician. It's, uh, yeah, he's QA. Uh, he's more like the inverse of QA because he comes in and knocks stuff loose and, so this is a little bit of this is a graph that uh, we did for ArmSock, and for some reason when it when it copied from Google uh, spreadsheet into Google Slides, it cut things up a little bit. So it's kind of weird, but the important part is here. So the this is a little bit of why I started doing. We started automating board farms, and it comes a little bit from ArmSock maintaining. So the yellow line there is the, um, the number of uh, boards supported by device tree just in ARM. This is just under ARM. So we're approaching 1,200 platforms that have device tree, individual boards uh, supported by device tree in the kernel. And the, the blue line in there is the kind of the legacy. Before ARM switched to device tree, it's the number of boards we supported kind of by legacy board files. Um, so you can see we've been kind of slowly removing board files, the legacy way to do it. But as we added device tree, we're, I mean, it's a pretty steady ramp. Every, every release, we have more and more boards. And so uh, in the kind of early days of switching to device tree and when I started helping out with ArmSock, we were realizing that, uh, you know, we have a lot of platforms out there and the kernel, we're, there's constant breakage. It's really easy in, in ARM land, at least it, it, we're, we're getting rid of that a little bit, but it's really easy in ARM land to do something that works for your board and break somebody else's board. And we just had no way to catch that early. Um, we, we, caught a, we, we do catch some of it in review, but a lot of stuff we just never catch in review. And so we wanted a better way, you know, we've talked about this several times yesterday, several people talked about different ways of testing and CI and try to try to capture all this stuff. And so we really wanted to, to automate that for ARM, for ARM sock land. And so Olaf Johansson and myself had already had some small collections of boards. And so, so we just decided to start automating this and scripting it as much as, as much as we could. And, um, so that's why, that was kind of the genesis of this project. It's kind of evolved into kernelci.org now, but the beginning of it was basically a need to let ARM maintainers know everybody maintains their own little boards and their own subsystems, but um, to be able to let them know early when they're when they're breaking something. And just the, the sheer growth in it, we, and we still don't have anywhere near full coverage of this, but we're approaching maybe 20% of the different platforms that are out there. Uh, maybe not quite that much because they keep adding new platforms too. 
So yeah, that's that's I guess what I was just saying. So um, and at the beginning, it was it was definitely focused on uh, on just ARM subarch maintainers because that's where the that's where we were maintaining and that's where our pain point was, and we wanted to be able to catch this stuff. So at the beginning, it's very ARM focused, and while well, you can still see that when when you when you'll see some more, you'll see that's mostly ARM platforms in the in the farm. Um, most of my lab is ARM, I, although I do have some MIPS um, as well. So this eventually became kernelci.org, and so that's what I'm kind of mainly going to talk about. Um, but this, essentially, it's building, booting, and reporting. Um, we've been, uh, a few people have also mentioned the Intel Zero Day project as well, which is also doing some of this. Um, the problem, that the, I would like to use Zero Day, especially for the, the building part. The problem is, I actually talked with Fun Gwang a few times about this, and the problem is the his servers are generating builds so quickly and so rapidly that they can't actually publish the results anywhere um, because actually putting them, putting them, pushing them someplace where they could be pulled by others actually takes longer than doing the builds themselves. Um, and they're doing so many builds that just generating the output uh, was hard. And then there's also some, uh, they had some, apparently there are some issues they had with just legal reasons why they didn't want to publish pre-built binaries and stuff. But the, the, main, re the main reason was um, they're just doing way too many builds, and so I would have liked to have used their stuff for the getting build outputs, but right now we're, we're doing our own builds. We may be able, still be able to work something out to share builds. Um, but basically we're building a whole stack of uh, uh, mainline trees, Linux Next and Stable, and uh, Greg is also publishing kind of a, what he calls Stable RC, which is like a stuff that he's queued up for Stable, that's, that he's proposing uh, to go into Stable, and we, so, so we test that as well. Several various maintainers have requested their trees to be part of this as well, so we have various maintainer trees. Um, and right now the builds are ARM, ARM64, x86, and MIPS. So we're doing, a lot of the architectures have several different build configs already checked into the kernel, so we're building anything that's upstream, we build all those. And then we also add a few of our own little variants, uh, like for ARM, we can add Thumb2 and a few different kernel options for ARM. Um, so because of this, we have, uh, for a given board, it might actually, for a given kernel, it might actually boot the same board five or six times because of the different types of def configs that it actually builds. So, um, yeah, and we build big NDN, and there's, yeah, we're, we're at like two, over 250 uh, different kernel configs that are actually getting built for every kernel that comes out. So there's quite a bit of builds going on. We don't have quite the hardware at, to, be, to throw at this problem right now because it's mostly, um, it's, nobody's really working on this full time. The build servers right now are hosted at Lenaro. Um, they're the ones that put some hardware behind it. Uh, we actually did get some donations from HP as well. So we have some rackable servers now at one of our, one of the guys has them in his garage um, that we're getting set up. So we should be able to increase builds here pretty quickly. But the main focus of kernel CI, because zero day is doing build stuff and build detection so much better, we're, we don't, you know, we're not trying to compete with that. We're just doing builds in order to do boots. So the, the main part that we want to get at is basically booting on as, on a wide variety of hardware as possible. So that's the, that's kind of the main goal. So we have right now in the farm, there's 31 different types of SOC families. Um, across ARM. They're mostly ARM and ARM64. There are some MIPS and there's some x86 boxes in there. Um, and then, so there's, between all the different labs, there's 200 different boards. And uh, we're doing, yeah, we're doing well over 2,000 boots every day because of the, all the different builds that are coming through. But like I said, a given board might boot multiple times for a given kernel because of all the different def configs. So as of, as of uh, a couple days ago, we hit 2 million uh, boots. When I proposed the talk, I just put 1.5 million boots in the subject, but now we're actually over 2 million um, since, yeah, since the middle of 2014. So the, the, that stats page there actually keeps up to date. It'll, it, it has stuff on how many boards, how many things we're doing each day and so on. Some interesting data there. Losing my voice.
And then the report, the reporting piece is also pretty key. Again, zero, do, zero day is doing this way better um, on the, the build stuff and way quicker than we can. Um, we have a lot of stuff also on the web, kind of historical stuff. So when, when you notice something that's, that's broken, you can also look back at the history of how that platform is booted. And a lot of times the same board might be in a couple different labs. So you can get, a, if, if your board is booting, you might see that it booted in one lab, but it failed in a couple other labs or something. And often usually that's like a lab setup issue. So there's some redu redundancy there across multiple boards. So the web interface allows you to kind of mine all that different data. It also gives you a history of when it started breaking. So you can do, you can either trigger a bisect or you can manually bisect if you're the only one that has that board. Um, so it's kind of, it's still, it's still pretty targeted at the people that care about those particular pieces of hardware. So the maintainers for these platforms are, are always looking at this. Uh, when a new kernel pushes, they often are the first ones to kind of look at kernel CI and see what happened to their board um, as, as next is coming out or as stable is coming out or so on. Yeah, so this, there's just more, more mess. So I just cleared off a bunch more shelves because I, the other interesting thing about doing this, as soon as I started publishing, as soon as we started publishing results, people just started sending me hardware. So I've had to, I've had to clear off space as more hardware comes in. I guess it's a good problem. And everybody always asks when I do this how I hook everything up. So at the end, I have a little diagram of how and kind of the basics of how I do it. Because you obviously can't tell much from just the mess of cables, but I will go over that a little bit. Um, so yeah, so the, the main goals of kernel CI have been basically trying to get at the testing of such a wide variety of mm -hmm. hardware. The, the kernel... Um, the kernel covers so many different devices and the level of test coverage we have when it comes to actual pieces of hardware is relative, I mean, is really low actually compared to the types of hardware that's actually we support. And so the goal was to kind of, to um, cover more of that than we were doing. We're, we're still nowhere near getting it all. And also to quickly find regressions because a lot of times we, we, uh, we we're just breaking stuff and not knowing it, and then it takes it, it goes for a long enough time that we end up but to fix it, you actually have to fix a bunch of other things and you have to fix a bunch of other problems. So finding stuff quickly again is the is the key. Um, the other goal of kernel CI has been to have it distributed. So I've got a board farm, Olaf had a board farm, several other people had small collections of boards, and we've kind of been slowly getting them together, and we want to be able to have anybody that has a, a board farm be able to contribute to this. Um, and so since we started, we actually have, we're up to 10 labs now. So all these companies that are listed here, which are, tend to all, also all be small consulting companies like ours, um, they have form, uh, various board farms and automated. And they have, we all have slightly different hardware. There are some, we all have Beagle Bones and we all have Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. But each lab has a little bit of different hardware. Um, so it's actually good to have things really distributed. Um, and, th and then we're also not super dependent on any one particular board or one particular farm. So the goal all along has been to, do, to be distributed like this. Um, the goal has also been to be kind of independent of how you put your stuff together, what automation framework you're using or what testing framework. Um, most of these labs are all using, actually they're all using Lenaro Lava, except for mine. Uh, mine kind of predates uh, Lava's evolution into something that was useful for this. But now, if I were to do it again, I would probably use Lenaro Lava tool as well. Um, but mine is kind of based on some homebrew scripts and hacks. And, um, so yeah, the, but the end result basically, it's get the, whatever the tool you're using, you generate the reports, you have to generate a little bit of JSON and push it up through a REST API at to kernelcei.org and then it kind of, it kind of, uh, aggregates all the data and generates the web interface. Um, so it's, it is independent, although if you wanted, if you, if you wanted the quick start way is still to use Lava, if you want to set up your own lab. And the other primary goal is everything is open. Um, it's documented on the wiki. Not, every, not everything about how everybody puts their labs together is on the wiki, but the wiki kind of has a kind of big picture of how all the pieces fit together. And um, yeah, the REST API is, uh, is all documented as part of the, the web interface. So how you push stuff, how you pull, pull stuff down. You can get triggers for when new builds show up if you want to run 
your own boots. Um, you can, it, it documents how you push results, whether they're boot results or test results or build results, all that kind of stuff can just be, is done that way. And then of course we have a bunch of scripts that do it that you can look at as well. And then the IRC channel, of course, where we, where we talk and discuss how this fits together. So like I said, there's, not, there's, only, there's only three kind of people working on this and none of us are working on it full time. Um, but that's the kind of the primary folks who are, who are doing it. Questions yet? So, uh, uh, since you say that your lab here and everything that uh, uh, the stuff is open, you, uh, why don't people send you boards? Are you now encouraging people to actually build their own uh, farms and maybe companies to, to maybe build their own? Yeah. Usually what I tell people is there's an easy way and a hard way. The easy way is you send me a board and I'll just put it in. But the, the better way and the more scalable way is to build up your own lab. If you already have a lab, and it's, it's better, it'll scale better. I mean, like you saw my little office. My office is small, so I can't take hardware forever. And so it's not scalable either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if, you send me, if you send me hardware, you also have to send me money so that I can build a bigger office here. Yeah. So this is usually the, the other important piece, and this, this was talked about a couple times already of, of the, so booting is fine and good, but booting is just, you know, all we'd really test for a boot test, if it boots to a shell, actually if it boots to a RAM disk that has a shell, that's a pass. So obviously that's not testing a whole, a ton of the kernel. It actually does load if the, if the, um, if the uh, it also loads all the modules, the, the little RAM disk that's there will load any modules that get probed as well. But it's still not testing a lot. But we still are finding tons and tons of bugs and regressions just trying to boot kernels to a shell on, in Linux Next and in mainline and stuff. So um, it, you'd be surprised at how much stuff you find just that breaks the boot. Um, well, it breaks the build or it breaks the boot. And so there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit, actually, in just doing boot testing. But at the same time, we are working on doing more testing, uh, running these types of tests. But uh, I think like Laurent was mentioning yesterday, the, the problem with a lot of these tests is they all have, they all have different types of output. They all have different ways of detecting pass fail. So there's still a fair amount of work to actually collect the results in a way and present them in a usable way that can actually find, um, find regressions, not just failures. Because when you're running these tests all the time, a lot of these tests have lots of known failures. And so you don't want to see necessarily all the failures. You want to see essentially diffs or regressions between the testing. And so the tricky part isn't actually running tests. The tricky part, at least in my, in my view, is figuring out how to generate reports and results that are usable. Uh, and I think the zero-day folks have figured this out in, a, in for several of the test suites have figured it out well. So we'd like to reuse some of that stuff as well. Yeah. We are the um, we're boot testing RT kernels because yeah 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 so it, this yeah yeah the uh, well it, again it runs like cyclic tests it's which is not quite the same as testing you know the different it, it runs it and generates logs but we're not really doing much or parsing the logs or seeing if there's difference in jitter or anything yet so it's it's right now what uh, we're all, we're at the point of being able to automate the fact that the tests run but we're not the the reporting and the actual you know detecting regressions isn't doing anything useful yet yeah yeah Yeah, that, I mean, they're all in that RT test repo, right? I think that's, in, I mean, cyclic tests comes from that same repo, yeah. So me, me personally, I haven't been working on these, these tests as much, but there's some work at Linaro that, to get these running. 
there's been even case self tests. We actually did. We had to do a fair amount of work on case self tests just to make it, um, you know, cross compile and be able to run. There's a lot of there. There have been assumptions in case self tests from the beginning that it all runs on on the host, which is not the case in uh, in ARM land. <clears throat> So yeah, this is one of the areas where we're actually asking for help because I've been more focused on boot test side of things and the kernel side of things. But um, we actually want to, we, we can we can run all these tests and generate a lot of data. We still need help in actually analyzing the data, generating useful stuff. And this is where the API comes in too because all the logs and stuff are just pushed into the back end, but we're not doing anything with them yet. So if you if you want an experiment, you can actually write your own tool to go and download these logs and start looking at how and maybe have some ideas of how to better uh, how to analyze these logs and detect regressions. We'd be we'd be very grateful. So some other stuff that that's that's also in progress or in kind of working. Um, you can kind of do. We have this compare view now on the website where you can uh, you can if you have two similar kernels. You can essentially kind of diff between them and see things that have changed between them. So just in, in terms of errors and warnings and stuff, but also just in terms of kernel size, um, module size and things like that, which is sometimes useful. Sometimes you see a module suddenly got huge. Um, and boot time as well. If boot time changes. Um, you, we're tracking all that stuff. So this is again where the, as we, as we do all these boots, we're generating all this data, we're shoving it into the database, and we're, we're just barely scraping the surface of what we, what we might actually be able to do with a lot of this data. Um, so seeing nice plots of boot time evolving over you know, image size and boot time and stuff evolving over time would also be some pretty useful tools. And um, we haven't written those yet, but we're hoping that other people will help you know, write those. Because all the data is just there and ready to, ready to, ready to be mined. So your question was about this, okay. <laughs> so um, this is another area that we're we're working on actively as well is is basically power power regressions and energy regressions. And so um, yeah, we we have some uh, there's there's a few different types of devices out there that I'm using. Um, there's several out there. I use the Arm Energy Probe, and I also use this uh, Acme board that we we make at Belib, which is basically a, a cape that mounts on top of the beagle bone. Um, and it has eight channels, and it's got these. The little probe on top uh, is basically you can plug your power supply in one side and your board in the other side, and this can actually cut power. So it's useful for power power cycling the board, but it also measures power consumed at the the main DC input. And so with with one of these capes, you can do eight different boards. Um, and the, I'm just showing the the kind of regular DC barrel jack connector there, but we also have probes that'll do it for U boards that are powered over USB um, as well and a couple other probes. So this is just one of the ways there are some boards have actually onboard um, current measurements and stuff that you can actually probe from it from the kernel itself um, and we, we can use that as well. But the goal again is just to be able to plot and chart you know voltage and current consumption over a boot process or over test as well. Um, especially if you're if you're testing CPU idle or testing CPU freak or things like that, you actually want to see if those those tests are actually changing the voltage and changing the current and changing the overall energy consumption. Um, so this is what this is one of the areas that's kind of under development. Does that answer your question? Or, yeah. um, but again, it, it's it's an area where we we're doing some of the tests, we're doing some of the measurement, we're logging all the data, and we're but we're not we're not to the point yet of being able to kind of plot it in cool ways and useful ways. But so the the, the hardware infrastructure is getting set up to do this. But I should have mentioned there's also this device. I think it's uh, I forget what the part number is, but it's Mon Monsoon makes a device that you can just plug in any sort of wall wall wart into it and it'll also measure this. I'm not a fan of those, especially for embedded boards, because you're also you're measuring the all the loss from the from the um, transformer and the brick, all the heat loss and all that. So it's not as good for it's fine for measuring bigger equipment, but for measuring embedded boards you're you're getting a lot of uh, noise in there. So 
So what's going on? What's next? Um, like I said, there, the test results, um, visualization for those, we need, uh, that needs work. That, that's a little, I, mean, I, sh I should say, yeah, this stuff isn't really in progress because the, it, ha it was in progress, but some of the folks at Lenaro that were working NASA are also, you know, preempted by some other things. Um, and for me, it's not full time. It's kind of a background task for me. So th these are all things that we'd like to see as next steps if we get more, if more people want to be involved and figure out how to help. Um, we also started doing, we're, we're interested in doing a lot more. Now that we have so many kernel boot logs in there, we want to be able to do better searching on the logs that are available. And so we started to put some, of, we want to put these logs, all the logs into something like Elasticsearch and be able to do stuff like, you know, I, my kernel started booting, it's passing, but there's this new warm, uh, warning message or a new, uh, new splat from LockDep or something. I want to know when that started happening and is it happening on any other boards? And that type of stuff would also be really useful. So it's not really failing, but it's like a little more diagnosis across a bunch of different uh, platforms. So right now it's not, it's not easy to really f go through and fully search the logs. Um, you'd have to download them and kind of grep through them yourself, but we'd like to make that a little more useful. Um, and we constantly re get requests from compiler developers to start, you know, building kernels with a lot more compiler versions and bleeding edge compilers and stuff like that and, and, and catching, catching build failures. Um, so that's kind of in the works. Um, and then more Arch support. Um, I just got sent some MIPS hardware. So I added MIPS build support to the builders now and it's generating MIPS builds. But I, the MIPS boards are still on my desk yet to be hooked up. I haven't quite got to those yet. Um, and then the other thing is kind of Cortex-M support. So the, the really low end kind of IOT type ARM cores, the really low power and uh, um, those are, we're adding, starting to add those as well. So I guess I've already begged a little bit about this stuff, but <laughs> these are kind of the areas that we need help. Um, the important thing too is if you if you have a piece of hardware that you're the maintainer for, or a class of hardware that you're the maintainer for, um, and you wanna you wanna detect regressions on stuff like that, yeah, let us know or send us the board or set up your lab, and and kind of let us know the. We're, we're also asking for feedback on the website itself because the um, the usability of it is uh, you know it's. It's useful for certain types of people, it's not for others, so we're always trying to improve that. So checking on the platforms you care about is really helpful, letting us know how it's useful. Um, and if you're finding stuff that we're not finding or it's not automatically detected, letting us know and then we can write some better tools to catch the regressions that we're not actually automatically catching already. Um, and of course, submitting fixes, we, you know, we, when we find stuff and bisect it, we end up submitting patches. Uh, I'd like to be able to automatically generate patches too, like Zero Day is doing, but we're not quite there yet for most of this stuff. And then of course, if you do have a collection of boards already, um, you know, figure out how to automate it or talk to me, I can help you figure out how to automate everything and uh, start submitting results. It'd be, it'd be great to add a few more labs and especially for hardware we don't have or architectures we don't have. Um, that'd be great as well. And yeah, if you want to take the easy way, you can always send me the hardware, as long as it's not noisy. <laughs> I have a small office, like you saw, so it can't, it can't be too noisy. In fact, even some of the embedded boards that I have that come with noisy fans, I usually pop the fans off because I'm just doing boot, boot tests and I don't care. <laughs> they don't actually need the fans. Um, so um, the other area that uh, we'd like some help in is, like I said, we are generating lots of data and the database is getting full of all sorts of different information about different hardware and different boots and boot times and energy and all this stuff. And so if anybody, you have some ideas of kind of big data um, ways to start looking at that, this data and, and generating useful results and, you know, cool graphs and charts and stuff like that, it would be, it would be helpful as well. Oh, so before I get to this, that's my, that's my poor drawing skills. Let me show this. So this is the, is that visible? Let me make it a little bit bigger. So this is kind of the, the main jobs page at Kernel CI. Um, well, I guess that's visible. What you, what you see here on, down the left, you can see all the different trees that we're building. Um, 
so there's Linux Next, and note several developer trees, um, stable trees, arm sock tree, uh, yeah, various little things in here. And this, this big picture thing gives you all the builds. So the gray is basically the number of total builds, and the green is the number of builds that, that actually passed, and red is that failed, and the yellow, I'm not sure what the yellow is for builds. Uh, it's basically builds that we don't know what happened, but I think we, uh, that's more for the boots. So again, on, on boots, the, some of these show zero because the, the build, the mainline must be in the process of building right now, so the build results are partially in and the boot results haven't actually started off. But if we look at something like uh, the stable RC tree, for example, if you, if you drill down, then you can see all the different, this is like the git, the, this value here is essentially what comes from git describe. So you can see kind of the, the current kernels and you can see that it's several different versions of the stable RC. There's a 4.4 and 4.7 were the most recent ones. And you can see the number of boots and the number of failures. And the, this other over here, some of the labs actually, for whatever reason, the boards are offline. Sometimes because you know some developers using it, it's marked it offline. So the the yellow number is you know it didn't boot, but it's not a it did, it's not a failure. It's a known uh, board is offline or something. But if you if you want to, then you can keep kind of drilling down here. If you click on one of these lines, it'll give you all the details for that particular build. Um, it'll take it gives you the commit, the number of boards that it was run on, the number of boot. I mean, this kind of gives you the pass fail thing, all the boards, and it it defaults to just show you the ones that failed. So this particular, there's one board in this particular lab that failed, and and uh, and then if you click on that, it can give you some more information. Tells you a little bit about the architecture. You can download the kernel image yourself if you want to. If you have that board, um, if you drill down even further, you get a lot more details. Um, the compiler version that was used, the device tree that was used, um, how the kernel was actually loaded, like the load addresses and where the kernel was loaded, where the device tree was loaded, all this kind of stuff, um, and also. Uh, the boot logs. This is this is usually useful as well. So you can click on the 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 boot log. It gives you the full boot, how the the kernels load the U boot loading the kernel, the full kernel log gets to the shell. So like I said, I mean you can kind of keep going deeper and deeper. You can get to all these levels of detail, and then you can go back in history as well for that for that board. So this, uh, if you go all the way down on this page, though, so here's here's what I was talking about for the bisect. So you get to the bottom, and it'll actually tell you that that this 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 board actually was booting just fine on this particular commit, and now it's failing. So you can use this to. We can also use this to automatically kick off bisect. But if you have that board and you want to bisect it yourself, all the details are there. Um, Any questions on that? I mean, there's you probably can't see all the details there, but I just this is just an example to to, to show that how you can drill down. And this other this at the top, there's also this SOCs tab, and it lists all the different SOC families that we support, and the and the all the different number of boards in that SOC family. So if you really only care about a particular architect or a particular SOC family, you can come in via this way, and it'll give you kind of a filtered version of the view that, that's only relevant to that particular family of SOCs. Like for myself, I maintain this Amlogic family of SOCs, so I usually start by looking at that and just seeing what's kind of new and what's what's failed in there. Any Any questions on the generic stuff before I... Before I go into this, this is my cable mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do, yeah. Yeah, so for def configs, we use all the, like ARM probably has 
I don't remember what we have. There's like 50 different def configs checked into the kernel. So we built all those. And then the, depending on the def config that's built, it will generate device trees for all the boards that are actually supported by that. And so then what we do is if, if the device tree gets built for a particular board, we just try to boot it on that board. So basically if the, yeah, we, we have kind of a way of detecting if we think that board is supported by a particular kernel build and then we just, we just try and boot it. And then there are some cases where we know that it's not supposed to work and we have to blacklist it. But in general, we just try booting it if we, if we think it should boot on that board. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And so the other thing in ARM, what we've done in ARM sock land over a while is we've kind of, we have this multi, it's called multi v7 def config, but it's like a one def config that builds for a, a wide variety of platforms. So it's also a little bit of incentive to try to get your kernel supported by the multi config. So it builds one, one kernel that boots on a lot of, I know, I know for people who are used to Intel, they're like, of course, why, why haven't you done that forever? But in ARM land, we, we haven't had that. There's been a lot of reasons why we can't do one kernel across all ARMs. But we're getting to the point where lots of ARM platforms can be supported in the same build. And so we'll, we'll often build for one board, we'll build kind of this multi def config and boot it across all the boards. And then there might also be a def config that's specific to one, one sub-architecture. And we'll also boot that one on that board. So the board can get booted multiple times for any, any kernel. Yeah, so, so then I usually, usually people always ask about this. So because you can't see my cable mess, this is a very simplified version of my, my cable mess for only a couple boards. So the, the basic way I do it is I power everything from ATX power supply, which provides 12 volts and 5 volts. And then I use these, uh, I use these 16 channel, basically 16 channel USB controlled relays for switching power. Um, so some of them I, some of them are 5 volts, some of them are 12 volts. Um, and uh, so that this only shows a couple of boards. But uh, And then I have these 28-port USB hubs, and I have several of them. <laughs> but most usually, uh, I mean, the, the PCs that I have only take two before, before things uh, blow up. So I have, a couple, I have to have a couple different host PCs for these. Um, and the, US, the number of USB ports just explodes, especially in, in ARM space, or uh, because you usually have a USB port for the um, the serial the console, or if even if it's got a DB9 or something, I'll use a USB to DB9 converter something for the serial port. But more, more and more, they don't even have most of these boards just have USB for serial. They'll all, often also have another USB port if it's an Android supported device for the fast boot connection. And then sometimes the board is actually powered over USB as well. So you can have three different USB connections on the thing. Um, so the, yeah, the, the, it's USB is, USB cables are probably most of my cables on the, in that mess. Yeah. Uh, all right, long shot. Sorry, I couldn't USB what per port? Uh, if you're using the kernel, uh, you have a spare port for a per port. Uh, I, I found some that you can implement it and some you don't. Yeah, so I, don't, I, I did look for some of those. I couldn't find any that were affordable. I found some that were really expensive that had per port power switching, but I haven't found any that are reasonable. What, I, what I've thought about doing is these um, these. These are Manhattan is the maker of these 28 ports. Each port has a push button. So I thought about popping the top off and using relays to push those buttons. But the problem is the, these USB hubs also have current limits. So if you're actually going to use it to power several boards, then it falls over anyway. So usually when, it, when I, I want to power something by USB, if it's just a power port, I'll use something else. I'll use... I'll either run the USB, sometimes I run the USB cable past this 16 channel relay and just snip the VBUS line and put it on the relay <laughs> and then let it keep going. Um, but that now actually I use the, so down here, this, uh, this Baylibra, this Acme board, we have USB probes for that too. So I'm using that for some USB power. If I want to actually measure the power as well, I'll use, I'll run it through past the Acme and then I don't have to snip USB cables. Uh, 
Yep. Yeah, so the serial port, so the, that's the, on the USB power switching, I actually wasn't sure how you, if the kernel actually supports toggling of power on those USB ports either. I don't know if it does, does it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah, I, I only looked into it a little bit. I haven't got that far on. So for the on the serial port thing, I, I run most of the serial ports are actually USB USB serial ports, or I have a I have a couple of like USB to eight port DB nine type things that I then use for some older boards. But most boards are just directly USB serial. So you plug it in, and it shows up as a serial port on the PC. Um, and so that's what most of the that's what most of these cables are. And then I also use so this Acme board I use for the the platforms that I actually want to measure power on. So I can I can either either use like the wall wart that comes with the board and run it through the Acme, and then I switch power and measure power on the Acme, or I use a uh, if it's a USB powered I can do the same thing through one of those probes. So this is like the this is essentially it. This is my lab. It's just it's I have like 80 boards in there now, and so it's kind of it's it's evolution, not intelligent design, um, in my lab as well. So, yeah. Oh, can we have the mic? Uh, I like to add that uh, far from consisting in a cheap uh, in USB uh, controllable uh, power source, uh, in fact, the, the cheapest uh, GPU in the world has uh, a MOSFET, a controllable MOSFET from the USB port, which is connected to the PCI. No, that's right. <laughs> But how many ports? Oh, just one port. Yeah. 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 That's good to know. Yeah. Anything else? Complaints, criticisms, thoughts? Everybody's hungry? All right, I think I'm done. Thank you.